Multiple Regression or Multivariable Calculus, the King Discipline among Correlation Causality Calculations. Korrelation ist nicht gleich Kausalität. This is my submission for the three blue, one brown Summer of Math Exposition Competition. Essentially, we're just inviting anyone who wants to to submit some kind of math explainer. Enjoy. At the beginning of every solution, there's a problem. I once noticed that often when somebody is looking for a correlation between a dataset Y and a dataset X, uh, Y and X, many times they are only looking for purely simple linear correlations. And that's it. Lineare Funktionen sind geraden im Koordinatensystem. Lineare Funktionen f von x ist m, x plus n. For example, the annual cheese consumption correlates with the number of bad sheet entanglements. But the supreme king discipline is, if you don't just have a vector, but a huge matrix of many data sets and data points with many independent variables. And you can choose your solar function at libitum and at speeditum. And you just have to fit your model to find the coefficients that are unknown at the beginning. And in this video, I'm going to explain how it works in a very user-oriented way. So, tell me, what is a mathematical function all about? Here, the famous exponential function, it comes with a fundamental groovy swing. <coughs> And this one is a so-called bathtub function. This is often used to represent failure distributions. And this is a hard function. No, wait. <coughs> a heart in the graph is not a function at all. Because here an x value has more than one assigned y value. And that's not clear enough. The pure stuff. Number theory, topology, analysis. Yeah, that's the good stuff, but not useful. So why would he care? The mathematician does not study pure mathematics because it is useful. He studies it because he delights in it. And he delights in it because it's beautiful. It's funny, that sounds more like how people talk about art than how they talk about science. As an inspiration for a non-linear solver function, we need a chemical physical background from semiconductor physics. If you don't have a scientific background for your calculations, it can happen that the professor asks you on your final presentation. So tell me, how did you come up with this? I made it up. What else? <laughs> At least you are an honest person. Originally, I'm not a real mathematician, mathematician, yeah, not, not at all. But my little brother is a math teacher, M math, math, a massive math, math teacher. So, but jetzt musst du mal sagen, dass du ein math teacher bist. I'm a math teacher. Nee, math teacher. So, wir sind ja bei britischem Englisch. Nee, mass und wie masse. A math teacher. And he told me about this contest. It does have to be about math, but math in the broadest possible sense of the term. So that could include physics or computer science, as long as it's got some mathy components to it. And you feel like you've come across a way of explaining it that makes it a little bit more memorable. You should definitely submit. He also showed me this Manum stuff, Manum, Manum stuff, which is a math animation tool, software. Now the way I do things is with programmatic animations. I sort of wrote this custom library called Manum to do that. And in the right context, I think it can be a wonderful way to let the visuals authentically reflect the math that you're describing, if the code is essentially just that math as it's illustrating things. But it doesn't have to be. But to me, it's like a foreign language, so I didn't figure it out. <laughs> it's, it's like learning English. And, uh, it, that's not my case. It's nicht mein Fall. Again, content is king. The first thing is to focus on what are you actually describing, and then just showing it however is easiest to show it in that case works totally fine. You don't need anything extremely precise or that leverages loops and abstraction for the formulas. Maybe I can improve my English. Mayday, mayday. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> I'm very bad in and at English at the same time. But I'm not shy about it. I just go with it. You have to deal with it. <laughs> just don't worry about it. Just dive right in. So many of us have no idea what we're doing when we begin. Give it a go. 
you're probably going to fail, but it's worth a try. But another genre entirely is the discovery journalism, where the person who is learning the topic kind of just admits that fact or is, is open about the fact that they're just starting with it and taking the viewer along a journey with them. And many times that's actually a better piece of content. It's actually better for learning the topic. Uh, and it comes with this inbuilt piece of humility that a lot of online content lacks. My pseudonym is Sophia Transistor. At least I have some degrees in it, so I think I am an electrical engineer. And during my work as an electrical engineer, I started to love and appreciate multiple regression. First in my bachelor thesis 2010, and second in my PhD thesis 2015. So we start with concrete and real application background. So yeah, you know, Fourier transforms neural networks, all that trivial stuff, it might be useful, but leave it to the engineers. So if you're doing physics and there's formulas that are relevant, don't shy away from those formulas. In search of causalities, nothing is more important than a scientifically proven mechanism of action. Please don't get excited or confused. We just take a brief look at the semiconductor physics formula sheet. You don't have to understand all of this. We are just looking for nonlinear functional equations. And what do you notice? There are a lot of exponential functions. In electrical engineering, we write EXP instead of E because E might also be the elemental charge, not to be confused with just Q. Later, it would be great if we could relate our coefficients to natural constants. Transistors might include a PN junction. Zoom into this uh, diffusion voltage formula and we got logarithmus naturalis. Logarithm naturalis. Logarithm naturalis. Okay. It's just a rearranged exponential function. So, here's a logarithm naturalis. We'll take it. And the next time when the professor asks you, how did you come across this connection? Then you can say, ha, it's taken from Physics of Semiconductor Devices, third edition, and you are quite safe. Try very hard to structure your explanation to go from the concrete to the abstract. So, in our nonlinear solver function, we have variables, our measurement data, and some coefficients, our constants. I could actually show you the values at the transistor hardware if I had one, but uh, I have to search. So I'm visiting my parents right now and they have some devices here in the cellar. We are looking for transistor packages. Can you read this? It says OPs and transistors. Uh, yeah. Okay, this looks quite old, I have to look it up. But I'm looking for something with three pins here. Yeah. It's a TO package. But in power electronics, we normally have larger ones. This one is quite small. And ah, this also looks like a transistor. I'll take it. So here is my demonstrator material. Better than nothing. My highly professional internet research has shown that this is a very famous transistor because it's on the main picture of the bipolar junction transistor site in Wikipedia. My current YouTube thumbnail shows the circuit diagram of a bipolar transistor. It's a messed up artificial art drawing. But I can show you something on it and with it. The three connections are called emitter, collector and base. At the package they correlate to the three pins. But first you have to look up in the datasheet which ones are which. And we will find our measurement values in the circuit diagram again. But what is the transistor device actually doing? Why do we need this? I'm not sure, do we really have to know it for the math? When am I ever going to use this? You're just working through worksheet after worksheet and it's all so unrelated to your life or anything that you could imagine being in your life. Ah, very short. A transistor can be compared to a switch. On the left, a mechanical switch which is open. You can't really see it from the circuit symbol on the right, but the transistor switch is also open. You can guess the state from the measurement values. It's in blocking state. Soon we will switch the mechanical switch by hand and the conductivity of the transistor is controlled purely electrical by a small base current. And now pay attention to this great animation on the left where the switch is operated. We turn on. Boop. Now we have a small base control current and can drive a much higher collector current through the transistor. Understood the principle? Well, let's go on. So if you're trying to teach math on YouTube and someone's not engaged, 
they're not sticking around. At the top, our solver function approach with semiconductor physical background, our variables are colored in green and we also see them in our circuit diagram in the middle. In terms of hardware, it's very easy to measure voltage values. And don't worry about the current values variables. When we are measuring current values, we are also just measuring reference voltage levels that are proportional to these current values. For example, via measurement shunt. But at this point, the great question is, what is the value of interest? What do we want to know? Which value are we interested in? As the formula is arranged this way right now, you might think that we want to calculate VBE on. But there's one variable here that we cannot measure very easy in the dreary reality. And that's the transistor temperature T. So our supreme goal is to find temperature sensitive electrical parameters so that we can calculate the temperature later on in cases where we cannot measure it so easily. So when you are doing the multiple regression you have to be clear about something. When you are doing the fitting calculation you have to know all of the variables, the X datas and all the Y datas. And with this well-known data set, we find the coefficients that give the best fit for our model. So, our next step is to measure the temperature very fast and accurate in a traditional way. Let's go! Here we have a wonderful infrared picture of my face. And what do you notice? My cheeks are noticeably redder than my temples. This means that I don't have a homogeneous temperature on the surface of my skin, but a temperature distribution. Yes. <laughs> so always use it to fool around. This all looks nominal. And here are some examples. I suspected this could happen, but the administrator just would not listen. I am rather looking forward to this analysis, aren't you? A fellow scientist. All right. I am impressed. <laughs> Transistor semiconductor chips do not have the same temperature everywhere either. In the middle it is usually hotter than at the edges. So we define the temperature we are getting is just the so-called virtual junction temperature. This photo shows a power module transistor package and it is closed. If you want to film the semiconductor chips, you would have to open the module and prepare it and spray some Owen spray over it to get the most accurate infrared measurement possible. And you can't do this in reality applications. In the laboratory setup it's okay, but in reality it's a no-go. It might explode easily because the package contributes to the dielectric strength. You could measure the temperature via thermocouple, but again, this would be too invasive and too slow. So, how else could you measure the temperature? Here in this picture, the chip within the module was heated via heating plate to static known temperature values. You can do this up to temperatures of around 150 degrees Celsius, because after that the temperature gradients might get too large, because the air temperature around the setup might be just room temperature and not heating plate temperature. So I think we are ready to go. We are ready for experiments. We will heat up our transistor by a very high collector current and then let's just see what happens. So we start our measurement with top model measurement gear, this oscilloscope. Okay, this was a um, typical not funny joke. Uh, joke. It was a joke. Scherz. <laughs> no, of course not. This would be too inaccurate. Inaccurate. Because we need a certain speed, kilohertz, megahertz, and also a certain accuracy of one millivolt, you could start with oscilloscope probe measurements, but you will see too much interference, and then you have to think about something else to improve it. On the bottom right, there's our device under test, the power transistor itself. It's connected to the base drive unit where we can get our measurement values. And now we are going to learn something about ADC magic. Instead of a big oscilloscope, we use a very small ADC IC. That's an analog to digital converter. In particular, we use a 16-bit ADC. We remember the coherences and calculate 2 to the power of 16. This corresponds to 65,536 values. In reality, our ADC is limited to an input voltage range and it has a positive and a negative saturation voltage. The delta between these voltages corresponds to a voltage of 1.566 volts. 
divided by the possible number of values equals an accuracy of 24 microvolts. This would be the theoretical resolution of our voltage measurement. And the question is, should we push it to this max? Because, as we determined before, we just need an accuracy of 1 millivolt. And the answer is no, we shouldn't, because we need a certain measurement speed. Therefore, we should divide our voltage levels in front of the ADC down to very low voltage levels, because the ADC has input filters that need a certain time to be loaded by the voltage levels. For clarification, at the beginning we have an analog voltage value of around 3 volts for VBE. We have to step this voltage down by a resistive voltage divider to receive an appropriate voltage value for the ADC input. We are building our measurement system on a new circuit board because this one is obviously already totally overloaded. Attention! Attention! Super animation alarm! The PCB is gonna fly now! from the left. Fantastic! Nice job! Now it's piggybacked to the driver PCB and the ADC I see is this small device over here. The rest is just measurement circuitry, like a flash voltage clamping circuit. The whole board is about 8.5 by 6.5 centimeters in size. For the English speaking area I will probably have to convert this into feet, two feet, one foot, but because the circuit board is so small a foot is much too big. Therefore here the size specifications in inches. Here a very nice picture of the real-life printed circuit boards. By the way, this is a well-used board that has been measured from head to toe. It also has standing feet. And here the famous image of the traction unit made by Fraunhofer and the measurement PCB can be plugged on the base drivers on the right. It might sound trivial, but a very important dimension in our measurement is the time. The data points are collected in matrices and we receive data sets at specific time points in life. But time measurement is very easy, it's just the clock signal of our control unit. It's a very precise clocking heartbeat in megahertz range. And now I sprinkle some knowledge from binary calculations. Our ADC spits the measurement values as I16 signed integer values via SPI to our data processing system. So our value range ranges from minus 32,768 to 32,767 in the decimal system. Remember, this comes from being able to represent 65,536 values. And now a concrete value example. The following value in binary system equals A81 in hexa system and in decimal it's 2689. So we receive this value from our variable VBE and we want to know which is the corresponding real voltage value behind this. Therefore the ADC has a transfer function channel n plus minus channel n minus is the actual analog input value in front of one of the input channels of the ADC. So we rearrange this formula and we don't forget that we also have a voltage divider of 47 points. In data channel n we put our value of 2689 and we calculate a VBE voltage of 3.0726 volt. If we assume the smallest possible number difference between the data values, which is 1 because we cannot represent decimal places, and if we recalculate the neighbor data into corresponding voltage values, we observe a difference of 1 at the third decimal place. And the third decimal place in volt is millivolt. So the desired voltage accuracy of 1 millivolt is achieved. And I've been asked a lot by the man in the audience if my data is really real measurement data or if it's filtered or beautified or something. And the answer is yes, because <coughs> what should I do? You can zoom in so far that at some point you might see some noise. I did it right here. And what do you observe? The measurement values are somehow quanted. And that's because why? These are digitalized analog values with an accuracy of 1 millivolt. Our calculated virtual junction temperature is here and as we see, we see a delta temperature of just minus plus 1, 2 Kelvin. And in power electronics that's fair enough and very okay, because if your device is around 150 degrees Celsius or around 150 and 1 degree Celsius, makes no difference anymore. So interesting, isn't it? Now you have seen how it works and also gained some background knowledge around it. Moving on. So what makes people engage with math? Relevance, you know, connect it to the world, preferably connect it to the audience's world. Sometimes data analysis is like a secret chocolate bar. 
You never know what you get. Strawberry. Now what's funny is fiction makes no attempt to answer this question. I didn't ask that because we understand fiction appeals for an entirely different reason. It's about emotion, you know, it's about wonder, it's about establishing a mystery that you just need to see resolved. It's about introducing a romance that you really want to see come to fruition. It's a warm escape from a world that to a lot of us can be cold and sometimes lonely. Okay, the first measurement results are ready for plotting. We start with a simple two-dimensional graph with three variables, VBE on and IC, and the third variable, temperature T, is drawn in sequence, quasi in quantum, a quantum T. It will be even more beautiful in a three-dimensional graph with three variables. So I think if you had some alien civilization that came, but they had a very good spatial conception for four dimensions, they would look at our vector notation and think that it was not capturing the deeper realities of math. Arguably. Who knows? Reality measurement via 16-bit ADC. We see the logarithmic dependence only at small IC values, but I cut them off at 10 ampere because they are not relevant. Because heating up devices only happens at high currents, around 50 amps. This result area looks really much like a functional connection. Okay, also with a dominant linear dependency, but I don't care. I take it. Observe this plot of simulation data. The logarithmic part is just relevant for small collector currents. In this plot, two variables are missing. What about VCE on and IB? I have to justify. The great thing about multiple regression, if you have many variables that may all have an influence on the outcome, you can use the fitted coefficients to determine which variable has the most significant influence. And so I can continue to simplify. So I neglected that logarithm because it's quite linear in our interested range. Here in the middle column of this table, I listed the expected variations over time for each variable. And I multiplied each delta with its many Matching coefficient. And as we see, we see that VBE is our most significant variable because we calculate a delta T of around 54 degrees Celsius. This is also our expected temperature swing during heating up, so it's reasonable. And as we see, the other variables are correcting the result a little bit, but they are less significant. So don't worry, all the variables stay in the formula. But that's the explanation for why we already see such a beautiful result area in a plot with just the three main variables. Okay, now the part with the actual calculation should come. When I was still at university, of course I made it, no advertisement, with a software called MATLAB. This software has a wonderful curve fitting tool that also features wonderful visuals. But I'm out of university for almost six years now and as a private person you can't afford a MATLAB license anymore. Here's the curve fitting toolbox and I'm definitely not going to buy it just for a few seconds of a YouTube video. Don't give up at this point, go and ask a search engine, because nowadays, for many popular licensed software, there might be a priceless open source alternative available that might be even better than the expensive ones. Trust me. Alternatives for MATLAB are GNU Octave or Scilab. Listen people. I am aware that until now I have philosophized far too much about data acquisition and far too little about the actual act of mathematical multiple regression computation. A fact that could possibly easily disqualify me from the math competition, but only if anyone noticed, otherwise I stand by it. But what kind of teacher would make a tutorial with every single step explained? No. I would like to spark the thirst of action in everyone who is interested to look for tutorials themselves and to go on and on to fit and multi-regress as much as they can. Here I tend to focus more on the application. Do you remember the video where I talked about battery aging and condition diagnostics using thermal impedance spectroscopy? Well, that can also be done with semiconductor devices. If now you can determine the temperature of the transistor in real time and in on-state operation on the basis of the physical background and using mathematical modeling and calculation, you can use it to determine the so-called transient thermal impedance curve. You use a new curve as a reference and if your component ages and there's a deterioration in the cooling path, then it will get hotter and also gets faster hotter than a completely new healthy component. 
So you can say exactly that there is a deterioration and you can even use the change in shape of the curve to calculate where the error is in the package. And by the way, you can also use it to easily and conveniently detect acute overheating problems and act accordingly before a major failure or accident occurs. Explosions are always spectacular, but the great art is not to let them pop. I mean having comedy, having some notion of characters that you care about. I mean having a mystery you need to see resolved. Really, anything that pulls you in for the math, for what it is now, not what it promises to give you later, in a way that suggests there's something deeper at play. Because what we can do is walk through, step by step, the problem-solving tactics that could lead you to find the clever insight to answer this question. Hi, it's me again. And it looks as if I take my time to make an off-moderation right now. For you. Go ahead. Data science. The science of data. Data analysis is important because on the base of data analysis results some very important decisions might be made. And I say important decisions and not good or bad decisions because it depends on the observer. So making this video I learned that I have to learn more about data analysis. Data analysis or how I call it data poking. Of course you can do it if you want, but I recommend also to listen to your stomach. In German it's called Bauchgefühl, a direct translation would be to listen to your stomach feelings. Don't just run after all the data you can get. Also consult your body and your mind and your head and your stomach from foot to toe. So wish me luck for the contest. In German you also say Daumen drücken, push your thumbs. So thanks for the contest, otherwise I would not have made this. <laughs> Stay safe, stay clean, and stay interested in mathematics. Mathematics maths. So, greetings to all English understanding people around the world, and I say ciao with A. In German, you would say schö mit Ö. But here's the thing about math even if it's not useful, even if it's almost trying not to be useful, it has a way of coming back around. So, what makes people engage with math? Well, Honestly, I think the most compelling answer is neither the usefulness nor the story, but understanding the bizarre way that they intertwine with each other. You know, the easy half here is that sometimes the best narrative is rooted in a really good application. But much more counterintuitive and just as true is that some of the most useful math that you'll ever find, or that you can teach, has its origins in someone who is just looking for a good story. Thank you very much.